Okay, so we're recording, and Andrea, the meeting's yours, matey. Yeah, thank you, Nicolas. Uh, welcome to the 9th of April, 2024. Um, we have probably, I don't know, uh, are there any, any, is anyone new in here that would like to introduce themselves or uh, anything else? I might as well. Um, I'm Malcolm. I work for Anaconda uh, on the VWare team, which uh, is all about user interfaces on um, mobile and desktop platforms so far. And um, I'm just starting to get into PyScript and seeing if there's some way we can work together. Right, Malcolm. Thank you. Um, if anyone else has anything else to say or share, we can move into the. Uh, okay, so in the agenda items, there are there are no announcements. Does anyone has any announcements so far? Actually, I put my agenda item that should be closer to an announcement. And uh, Martin is editing the document, so... <laughs> um, right, no announcements. Great. So let's move into the agenda item. So... Nikos, dock the things. That's okay. The... Yeah. Okay. So with PyCon just over a month away, um, with uh, various talks and um, tutorials and presentations about PyScript happening at PyCon, um, I think uh, it would be nice if we got our house in order. Um, the documentation has certainly evolved over this year as the platform has changed and evolved as well. And so I mentioned this about a month ago about a um, spending a week where we uh, as a team, as a community, as contributors uh, can come together and just organize our docs, make sure that the various niggles and bits and bobs that don't make sense anymore or are out of date or we've not quite done in the right sort of a way uh, are done. We need to do this before PyCon. It's probably better to do it sooner rather than later. Um, I know we have a uh, uh, we should be doing a release sometime this week, I guess, Andrea, uh, with the new MicroPython related things that I'm not going to mention uh, because you're going to be demoing them in about 30 seconds. Um, uh, but once we have that release out, we should perhaps concentrate on that. So I'm basically bringing this to folks' attention. Uh, and uh, please, can we just talk in the docs channel on this Discord server and organize? And perhaps maybe not this week, maybe not next week, but the week after, which means that it is the, uh, not this week, not the, it's the week beginning the 22nd of April. Um, perhaps we could use that week as our documentation week where we just concentrate on blitzing the docs and we collaborate and work together on that sort of a thing. So I'm just giving a heads up. So the week commencing the 22nd, if, um, just so that we get that in the notes. And I will liaise with anybody who would like to collaborate on this. And uh, I don't mind driving this, um, but we're a community. So please step up and uh, we can make this happen. That's it, really. Also, probably a, a great time to shout out because I know we have some some maintainers and we have some some old friends in the chat, some new friends in the call today. Um, I know a lot of people who are here have done various demos and created various things, whether you've seen them or not. So if you if you have discovered anything, all you out there, and I guess if you're watching this later on YouTube as well, and you've found something in the docs that you like, <laughs> I thank Nicholas for it mostly. And if you found something confusing, this is a great time to say, hey. Could you flesh out this section so next time people aren't confused? That's that kind of outside influence is always super helpful for us. Perfect. Yes, definitely, Jeff. Um, and also, since we're on the subject of docs and Jeff, uh, you should go check Jeff's blog out because it's a thing of beauty. Um, there's all sorts of wonderful things over there to do with PyScript. Um, so uh, if there's nothing else on docs, I think um, we could go on to the next item. I'd just like to yes. say that I've only been using PyScript for about two days, and uh, I've been really happy with the state of the docs so far. That's good to know. That's good Work. to know. Thank you. Yeah, the uh, evil is in the details, I suppose. <laughs> so <laughs> we need to somehow fix that, because we have a lot of people asking questions that we take for granted. Like, eh, of course you do this and that, but maybe we should improve at least 
the way people can search, find stuff on the docs, and uh, and yeah. But uh, let's move to the next topic, which is me, MicroPython terminal, and side effects. Uh, the end side effects is a happy ending story, but the micro and also mostly the MicroPython terminal is a happy ending story. Um, please allow me to share my screen. Share screen. Yes. Can you see? Yep. This terminal. Yep, we can see it. Awesome. So. This is uh, a very simple web page that is here. And um, this is script type mpy instead of pi. So mpy states from, is Python instead of pi. Right? Um, and it has this out of the box ability to import code, which is not really a module in MicroPython. Uh, it's a module that we actually provide out of the box. It doesn't exist, and it's not fully compliant with whatever module code does. And code interact, so these two lines are the most used ways to create a repo uh, out of Pyodide. And so um, right now it's possible to use seamlessly the same code in Pyodide or MicroPython. And that's the result. It's live already. It's not a local host, as you can see. It's actually live on one of the core libraries behind PyScript. And the only reason it's there is because it already has all the um, uh, mini koi and, and all the headers figured out, even to be on GitHub pages. And so it can work as a worker and it can work as, um, as a feature. So here we have uh, a terminal, a repo, and I can do pretty much whatever I want. I can say, um, yeah, just type it help. And actually that, that was uh, <laughs> um, something to talk about because there are few commands on the web that we need to intercept and fine tune the behavior. In this case, the, the MicroPython terminal says control A, on a blank line, enter new repo, and I can't admit to snooze my, sorry, my, my gnome. Uh, control A is to, is to do something, control B, control C, control D, control E. Um, this, this kind of commands needs to be forwarded. So this is a missing bit, but it's also nothing really you should care about on a, or probably nothing that important on, on, on a web MicroPython terminal. Um, everything else is fine. So if I have um, that full and I'm starting a declaration of a function and I can press enter, I can say a equal one, b equal two, um, return a plus b, and then I get out of this function declaration, I can just say, foo, yay, and I can see the output. So everything is fine. The only issue we have right now is not, is, is something that has been partially monkey patched on the PyScript side, but it cannot be patched fully on the MicroPython side. And um, that's, that's an issue that uh, is, oh, I don't have the issue here. Oh gosh, I should have an issue. Um, maybe it's here. Yes, it's here. So if if we try to input something that uh, uh, uses something that's not ASCII chars, um, basically few things unexpected, unexpected things might happen. Uh, in this case, it's just pawn and I ask to print this exact string. Um, this is annoying because I was like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so turns out if you, if, you, if we do something like this, um, if we ask for an input and we type this kind of string, then we can print MP 
and have no issue whatsoever, or MP, we can see that is actually the exact sequence of Unicode. Um, uh, uh, the, the string is fully formed without issues. But we have an, an issue upstream with read line, and so there's, that's, that's the only caveat that we need to explain somehow, by docs probably, or if, I don't know if we want to wait for the next macro pattern release, I don't know. The only thing I know is that everything works. So if this statement, for instance, is part of your script tag or your uh, source, external source Python file, this is gonna work, no issue whatsoever. But the moment you try to print something, which here I'm printing, I I'm just want to show you what the hell is going on. Um, it's, it's something always weird because basically the MicroPython doesn't understand and doesn't care and doesn't really consume um, uh, any, any Unicode out of the ASCII uh, charts table. Uh, it doesn't do any anything like that, and the, yeah, the issue here explains very well what's going on. So this is another another example. Sorry, more complicated because here we have um, combined emoji, and you see something unpredictable is happening. But that's the only really the only gotcha we had so far. And uh, if, if I try to instead um, copy this emoji and, and ask it as an input, um, emoji if input um, emoji, and I do this, then I can print emoji, everything is fine, and the moment we try to reveal what's emoji, you can see it's a very complex Unicode string. So this is the only blocker right now to have a full 100% MicroPython REPL, but everything else is working pretty fine and pretty good. So uh, it's um, it's been merged main, and uh, I hope uh, that things will be merged or improved or forwarded upstream too. And um, right now, this is the current state and I'm super happy, especially because I had to change, um, this is a bit more technical, uh, I had to change the way we handle um, the SDDIO and SDDR uh, entirely. So basically we have now in, in um, PolyScript, right behind PyScript, uh, that, that that's the one that enables the MicroPython environment or interpreter. Um, we have a way to actually accumulate somehow and uh, all the charts and then eventually print them out. And this has been brought as a utility also to the Py editor. So the good news is that uh, we can buffer weird charts and everything should work as expected. Now I'm going to I'm gonna fail myself eventually. Just this is my local thing environment, but just for the live demo sake, uh, everything works here. But how about I, 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 I try to print something else that uh, is like this complex emoji. And um, I'm not gonna lie, this is the first time I, I tried this. So <laughs> I just. <laughs> I just want to risk it all and do this. Yay! <laughs> and it worked. So, editor is fine, terminal is fine. The only thing we can't do in the terminal right now is, is if you actually manually type something like A equal, A equal, um, some weird uh, Unicode thing. Um, that's the only issue we have so far, but I think as a terminal in general is pretty stable and it works as expected. And a huge thanks to Antonio because I was like, yeah, I made an editor and Antonio was like five seconds later, but this doesn't work. And that was about the, the, the expectations of the fact that if you start declaring something, 
you actually want to see dot 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 and start typing the rest of the uh, the thing um, and yeah that's the latest status about MicroPython terminal but the cool part is that this page and I can share it I can refresh it as fast as I can <laughs> and this page works on my mobile phone too so that's something I think um it makes sense that the bug behaves that way because the bug isn't actually with MicroPython itself. MicroPython handles Unicode correctly. It's the read line library that MicroPython is using to read the input from the REPL, the raw input from the REPL. Um, that's the problem. Um, so uh, we, we should, you know, liaise with Damien and make that uh, a thing that works. I also noticed, uh, you know, um, Andrea, you pointed this out this morning. There are a bunch of Chinese users who really want this fixed as well. So if we can pay Damien to, to, to fix this for us, then there's going to be a lot of happy Chinese users of MicroPython as well. Um, and let's face it, uh, as MicroPython becomes more popular in the browser, um, you know, you're going to be encountering lots of more Unicode related things anyway, because of the kind of simply the wider user base that, that we have. But um, yeah, that's great. What's next? Thank you. Uh, next is you, actually, <laughs> Nicholas. You have uh, the rest of the, of the, uh, yeah, all. Okay, topics. you're going to have to remind me what they what they were. I think there were three more, weren't there? Three more. Yeah. So the next one is PyScript.net for PyCon. Okay. So um, PyScript.net is uh, is a beautiful website from 2022. Um, but it's a website from 2022 and PyScript, you know, is dead. Long live PyScript. It's a different version of PyScript and it doesn't work in the same way. And now that we have MicroPython working as a terminal, wouldn't that be great that uh, that would be the first thing that you see and people can actually start using Python out of the box on their mobile phone in a browser sort of thing. So um, I wanted to uh, kick off... Um, a discussion about that or flag to users that we want to do that. So again, I want to invite folks in the community. If you have feedback or ideas or things that you think should be seen on the PyScript.net website, which is the landing page for developers who want to use PyScript, then uh, let's talk about that on Discord. But the people that I wanted to have in the meeting to in order to be able to do this, which is Fabio, he's in another meeting at the moment, and uh, Jeff, who's had to leave. So uh, anyway, there we go. Um, they were the people that I hope that I'd be able to flag to because I know they've been interested in this in the past, but they're not here. But you can watch it back on uh, on, on Rewind or, you know, um, uh, on YouTube or whenever it is. So that, that was the first one. What's the second thing that I... Or are there any questions or comments about that before we move on? Martin? I don't... To be honest... Have any input now, or shall I wait till those people are in the room to talk about? I think it's better. Like theming. I think it's better that we have our discussion uh, asynchronously in a chat channel uh, on Discord, just so for visibility, so everybody gets an opportunity to participate in it and things. And perhaps next week in the community call, we can kind of very quickly summarise what's being said, and we can then perhaps further have a you know a bit more of a discussion and things like that. But um, yeah, I, I think that that would be probably the best way to do that. Any more for that? No. So what's the next thing then, Andrea? Okay. Sorry. Um, meetings and time zones. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay. So this is an apology from me um, because I'm in the UK. <laughs> uh when time zones got out of sync, when the US decided to do daylight savings a fortnight before, it meant all our meetings were out of sync. I've been spending some time this afternoon to try and make sure that that doesn't happen with Discord again, but uh, I've yet to get to the bottom of it. I think the meetings are actually linked to um, huh, to my time zone as the person who created them. So uh, I need to be aware of that when we, we next have a time zone incompatibility mismatch. I'm starting to sound like an error message now, aren't I? Time zone incompatibility mismatch, something that Doctor Who might say. Anyway, I, my apologies for the for the mishap that uh, that, that happened, and uh, we'll try and be more aware of that in the autumn 
um, in the equinox there when, when we change our time zones. So that was that. Any more on that? Um, please call me silly names because I can't do time zones, but then who can? Um. Uh, we'll be back in a few months. <laughs> okay. uh, next one. Unless anyone has any opinion or comment or... It, oh, nothing. if you want to see a really great talk on time zones and computers... Uh, I highly recommend our colleague uh, Russell Keith McGee's talk on that, which you can find at, I think it's a DjangoCon talk from 2019, um, where he goes into painful details about all the different ways in which time zones don't work and why computers are, are terrible at them. And it's a very, very good talk. I highly recommend that. Anyway, so. Yeah, quick, quick um, comment for me is that UTC has a reason to exist, <laughs> and uh, yeah, but aids and time zones are hard. Yeah. Next one is um, first steps in PyScript standard library tree shaking, which I have no idea what is this about. Still you, Nicholas. Yeah. Okay. So it, this is essentially you remember how we have a PyScript namespace into which we put all sorts of kind of utilities and interesting things. And that's starting to grow. And we talked about PyDOM and PyWeb and things like that. And um, and also third-party libraries and uh, stuff that might be hosted on PyScript.com. Um, but essentially, how are we going? I, I want to just start the discussion again. You can tell I've been on holiday, where I've been thinking about these things when I should have been on holiday. But anyway, uh, here we are. But at some point, we're going to have to work out you know, somebody somewhere doesn't want the 70K that is PyDOM and PyWeb or whatever it is. Okay, so we need a way of being able to tree shake the things, as it were, so that you only get the assets that you need. And this is especially important when you're working on mobile um, over the network uh, as well. So um, that's essentially me putting a pin in that discussion as well. Um, so any comments? So I can see Andrea has already got his hand up. So matey. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a great um, problem to solve. At the same time, we have minimum 300k runtimes <laughs> to load. Yeah. And, and I feel like there should be a threshold. Like uh, up to 100k, we're fine. Over 100k, we're not fine anymore because yeah. that, 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 that becomes um, a payload that, that's probably too high. Yeah. Even for mobile and stuff like that. Um, I think we are not there yet. I mean, we are still kind of tiny, and uh, I hope we can keep it tiny. But of course, it's a topic to um, to keep in mind every time we say, "Oh, let's let's bring in this entirety, the entirety of this library in Python or JS or whatever," um, because. The, the the line between tiny and fat is uh, very thin. Yeah. So um, it's a great topic. At the same time, I don't think we are we have core base big enough to be really worried about this. And whoever says I don't want seventy k, I want just sixty k, <laughs> is it or compressed? It's like okay, do you still realize you're loading three hundred k of Minimum 300k of runtime and, and extra libraries because 300k might be just the wasm um, binary and then there is the library on top. So we're still super fast. I think I can measure in milliseconds the MicroPython bootstrap. Uh, of course, we, we, we need to find not, not just uh, a, a way of thinking like we shouldn't put too much into it, but we should think about how do we measure um, latency and all these delays that we might bring in. So I'd love to see the discussion moving also around the measurement, around the bootstrap performance and all this kind of stuff. Because that benefits not just us, but maybe also PyLite, MicroPython and all the interpreters we yeah. want to eventually uh, embrace in the future. Yeah. I mean, do you... 
I mean, you, you've said all the, th the reasons why I, I essentially wanted to get this conversation going is that how are we going to measure this? It's not that so much for me that we need it now, but we need to get our story straight so that we, we will eventually get a threshold or somebody will want to contribute some big impressive thing that we want optionally for people to be able to, to use or not. You know, and it's not part of the package because it's part of a PyScript namespace. Or there will be some complicated reason why we we will need it. Um, I don't want this to be premature optimization, but I I also know that um, you know in the world of the web, just counting kilobytes is important um, at times. You know, I know jQuery is what eighteen k or something like you know some ridiculously small. Um, it'd be nice to. And that was from two thousand, right? So we don't have the twenty k problem anymore. So no, it's, but it's a bit, here's the thing. A yeah, but here's the thing. I'm there's potential for me again over the holidays because I'm not very good at going on holiday. I was talking to somebody in Ghana um, about PyScript, and you know, Ghana. I've I've been to Ghana. I've worked with tech folk in Ghana. And, uh, you, you know, their their internet infrastructure isn't, um, you know, mostly broadband. It's it's for three or four G mobile where you do start to think about the size, you know, the network latency, the the speed of the device and things like that. So uh, it, yeah, it's, it's still something that for, for, for accessibility reasons in where I mean accessibility because of infrastructure um it's it's something that we we certainly should try and be as fast as possible because you know these folks will, will definitely need it malcolm how much of this do you feel is down to just the download time and how much do you feel is down to the startup time of loading everything into the interpreter because the second half would always be there even if everything was ex ex exactly it depends which interpreter because micropython probably starts faster than i can go um it's a startup time whereas pyodide you've always got about two and a half seconds isn't it at the moment something like that um startup time so um, on desktop on desktop yes exactly it's several sec it's several seconds more on mobile um so and, and that depends on the computing power of the device upon which you're you're running so i what what i really appreciated and, and liked about what you were saying andrea is the first thing you said is we need a way of measuring this so that we can show improvement or we can work out where the pain points are um, and those points where we, we might not be able to do anything, like, for instance, the startup time with Interpreter, because there's a whole bunch of WebAssembly stuff that we don't really have much control over. Yeah, no, the thing is that very right or anything based on uh, um, is automated testing suits, uh, you, you can also dictate the bandwidth, uh, throttling, and uh, and this kind of stuff. So we can definitely, we have all the tools to measure that. We need a story, like you said, to, to, to implement measuring. And yeah. uh, maybe we, we, we need also a CI tool that tells us, hey, this new merge request is um, actually dropping any percent of performance or stuff like that. So that would be awesome. I'm not saying, I'm not against it. I'm super pro it. It's just, it requires a bit of effort and uh, investigation and discussion behind the scene. Okay, so perhaps where we should do this is as a feature request in the PyScript repository on GitHub, and we can start to put ideas together about what that story is. Um, for instance, you, you made a very good point. If there's a regression in terms of time because somebody's created a pull request, if that change is more than 10%, for instance, then you get a, a red warning or something like that. If it's more than five, you get an amber warning or something. You, you know, it's that, yeah. that, that sort of thing. We need to we need to get that written down. People need to understand why we're doing that. And um, and, and, and so we're, we, we, we make sure we get a, a, a good level of testing. But yes, okay. Um, so that's a to-do item for me, I guess. Um, I'll do that immediately after this call then um, get that working. Um, that's it. I mean, is there any, any more comments on, on this sort of stuff? Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, we're, you're muted. You're muted. There we are. Yes. I, okay. I'm Paul McGuire, and uh, actually I live in Austin, and 
So down the street from a lot of you fellas uh, at the Anaconda. Um, so just a couple of uh, things to underscore. Um, I do a package called pipe parsing, and I did a, a pull request uh, to my own package that uh, drew, dragged it out. I think it was like about a four or five second import uh, uh, because uh, at, the, at the start of time, I was building a rig X with about 3,000 uh, uh, HTML entities in it that it was you know, going to parse for. Not realizing that I had just sort of slurped all these things in. So yeah. um, Anthony Sotal did a nice uh, uh, online post on, on how that could get fixed. He posted a, a fix for that. But um, it's definitely, uh, you know, not just the download time, but also then <clears throat> what happens in the init to, uh, you know, kind of get things going is, uh, is, is certainly, uh, you know, relevant. Yeah. Um, also... Um, you know, there's sort of a, you know, standard kind of infrastructure of packages that people load into their scripts, whether it's, you know, Pandas and Matplotlib and so forth. Are, are, are you considering those at all in terms of, um, you know, when things get loaded in? I know that's out of your control, but, um, uh, you know, it's part of the landscape. Uh, you know, many of these scripts do pull those things in. Um, Andrea, do you want to answer that? I can see we both put our hand up at the same time, so I'm just I'm, <laughs> the floor is yours, Andrea. <laughs> so, packages or foreign packages are and not our direct scope or um, domain uh, specific domain in terms of responsibility. Um, when we 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 know that Pyodide is working hard to make. Actually, they did already to download packages in parallel and stuff like that. And they also use everything they can to cache as much as they can. But at the same time, we don't have control over that process because it's an API exposed. And we, we say, okay, here are the packages we would like to have. And that's an incremental process. So if you have packages that need to solve packages dependencies and uh, need to download other stuff. So that's complicated out of the box. Um, it shouldn't be, but it is because dependencies, uh, graphs are not super simple and they need to be resolved. And at the same time, I think Pilot got very, very is very fast compared to previous versions. At the same time, we don't know what to do there because we either we say we use a service worker and we um, up, uh, we over cache behind the scene. That's not necessarily desired. It's complicated in a, in a matter of setup and, and all that kind of stuff. I think Pyodide and packages are, um, are a problem well known in the Pyodide ecosystem and pretty well solved. What we can do, because with MicroPython also we have the, the ability now to inject packages and we can we can be smarter there, or as smart as Pyodide is right now. Uh, when it comes to runtime network execution that comes from different various CDNs or different endpoints, you also have to consider that there is a DNS resolver behind the scene and the file that has to reach the CDN and uh, all these browser internals that are hard to uh, interfere with. And uh, so we can do as much as we can, but we, can do, we cannot do more than that, I think, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, but there, you, you mentioned things like pandas and numpy and things like that. So when we're in the world of Pyodide, which is C Python compiled to WebAssembly, um, they already have uh, compiled in, built in um, those packages already. So you don't actually, ha there isn't a hit, as it were. When you import NumPy, uh, it's, it's there already. Um, there is work ongoing so that um, if you're at PyCon, uh, actually, <laughs> if you're at PyCon, there is a WebAssembly Summit happening on the Thursday. Come and say hello. And one of the things that we want to talk about is the state of packaging and things like that. And I know that the Python Packaging Authority and folks from Pyodide, the C Python side of, of, of uh, the PyScript runtime that we use, um, they've been talking so that WebAssembly is a first-class citizen, so that assets are compiled in the right way, so that if you have a C extension, it's going to be compiled and things like that. But of course, we're in we're in the world of the web, 
Uh, you need to get those things delivered to you each time you refresh a page. There are caching things that we need to think about. Um, there's the whole resolution of the dependency graph that happens every time you reload your page and things. Um, there, there are things that we could do, and I guess, you know, this is why we measure things. We want to base our decisions on evidence and work out where the point, pain points are as well. Um, but any, I, I can see he's got two hands up, so I'd better cede the floor. <laughs> I think this is a great opportunity to mention again that finally we have Zip and TarGZ uh, in our project. So you, if you are worried about packages that are not officially built into PyUDI ecosystem or MicroPython, you can always create your Zip of dependencies packages the way you want in pure Python, whatever it is. You wrap all that into a Zip and that's the only extra payload that you have. It's a single file with all the things in it. It's gonna be in the file system, virtual file system out of the box. You can import from those things basically because only when you import the Python behind is gonna evaluate that, that stuff. And, and that's also a solution, I think, to this problem. So mm. if you're worried about, okay, but I have this package, this module, this thing, this, and I don't know how to, I want to package this and I have to publish, you just provide a zip or target that. You, you use it in your CDN provider or your own project, which is already resolved by the DNS and everything else in the browser. Um, and that's gonna be fast too. Party, please. <clears throat> Yeah, so, um, yeah, the zip thing is brilliant. I was so happy when you did that. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and, um, but then, then we, we were talking about this earlier on with Nicholas about the, right, so now imagine I'm in PyScript.com and I'm writing, so I've created, like we, like we did when we were um, Tufts, for example, right, with, 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 with Chris. We're building like a little library that I want to share with everyone right away. So I'm in PyScript.com. Com. Now, now, when we're doing events, right, we can do the build step where we can just go, hey, build a zip, make this zip available. That's great. But what if I'm, what happens if I've just written some Python? I have no answers for this, right? I'm just thinking as a use case, how can we think about this in the future? Um, I, I've just got a little library. Now I want to share that with all the other people on the thing. And I don't want them to have to go, because what happens a little bit now is... I start writing a little library that's got a library that's going to be reused and you think I don't want to add another file because then you have to add another line to the manifest. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, how can we do that kind of in place? Like, can, should we do, can we do something in the dot, in the Tomal or the JSON where we, but anyway, I'm just putting that out there as a use case, whether we, someone, someone on PyScript.com won't necessarily want or have the ability to do a build step to create the zips that they want to share. Thinking just randomly, if you if we make it possible to create your own module on PyScript.com instead of a project with a index HTML and everything else, you just have a module template, which is different. Is your module your uh, dunder dunder in it and uh, and everything else, and you can share it with everyone else. Also, that solves the, the issue I was talking about about DNS resolvers, CDNs, because everything comes from the same place. So it should be faster, at least. But right. uh, definitely um, an interesting topic and some change we need to <laughs> be able to make uh, on, the, on, the, on the service. Yes, the, yeah. The, the important thing is that you've got options. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to to, to yeah. do those things. I, my hint for zip or target Z was rather a workaround for the current situation, but it's if if it's a concern that I have my own things locally, how do I use it uh, live? And you, you zip or target Z, you push it there, and that's the only file that you need to the extra download and extra bandwidth goes for, and it's already compressed, so you save already in. Else. Mm. It makes sense. I'm not sure if I <laughs> helped or answered anything, but hmm. yeah, okay. yeah. I, I think it's going to be a, 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 a really useful thing because, especially like you know, things like PyScript.com, like within organizations, um, 
it's kind of like a lightweight sharing thing right you don't have to within your group or your friends or your team you don't have to load things up to PyPy or PyPI and, and do things right or you, you don't have to pack things you just go hey share, like we were doing like quickly okay we're building this app everybody use the message bus package that I've just written and um, that I think is going to be a really powerful thing because it's really kind of yeah, again, it adds that communal, communal sense, right? Okay, we can just get this stuff up and running, it's shared, away we go, you know. The way it's solved in uh, other ecosystems I know, like Node, uh, Dino, Ban, they, they use a protocol. So if we have like um, pi.com column and then the name of the module, that can be out of the box the way you import modules from the, from the same web set of service itself. We right. Out there about caching, versioning, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this is just me <laughs> improvising solutions. But the, 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 like Nicholas said, the, there are options, and uh, it's, it's a matter of finding the best one. All right. Unless there are any other topics, discussions, questions, or bring it in, whatever it is, um, I think we're good. Okay, folks, I'm just going to stop the recording then.